Aloha and welcome everyone in person and online to the East West Center. My name is Susie Varislam. I'm the president of the East West Center and it's quite an honor and pleasure to greet you all and welcome you into this special place here in Manoa in Hawaii. I am um, also pleased to welcome you to this special dialogue with His Excellency Koji Tomita, Japan's ambassador to the United States. And today's topic will be deepening relations following the U.S.-Japan Summit, the importance of Hawaii in U.S.-Japan relations. So before I in introduce our distinguished uh, guest today in our dialogue, I want you all to know, especially online, that today's talk is recorded. And for those of you here present, you can share this with others. It will be posted to our YouTube site. Also, I want to thank Council General Aoki, and the Consul General staff for organizing this, as well as our East-West Center team here who helped to organize this as well. Also to our audience online, uh, we're really grateful all around the globe who have joined us today. And we'll give you a chance, of course, to be able to join this conversation. We're hoping that the first half I'm gonna spend with the ambassador to just have a conversation and then open it up to you here in the room and online to ask questions. So very quickly before I get into our dialogue, Ambassador Tomita really became the Japanese ambassador to the United States on February 17th, 2021. And his distinguished diplomatic career in the Japanese foreign ministry, foreign ministry of foreign affairs spans 40 years. And you know, prior to this posting, he was also Japan's ambassador to Korea. He was Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's personal representative for the G20 summit in Osaka, as well as ambassador to Israel, and has many other seas, overseas postings such as London and Paris. You know, he spent most of his life focused on security policy, actively involved in policy and legislative reviews, including peace and security. And his relationship to the United States spans many, many years, because I understand that the ambassador actually spent a year in North Carolina for school in his younger years, and then also held various leadership positions in U.S.-Japan relations, including the Director General of MOFA Northern American Affairs Bureau and the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Japan in Washington, D.C. And he has led many, many efforts to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance. And on another note I found fascinating was that he also writes in his spare time. There are two books he published, it's in Japanese. Hopefully it will be maybe translated one day to English because it's fascinating. Churchill, Leadership in Crisis, as well as Margaret Thatcher, Iron Lady Who Changed Politics, which won the Yamamoto Shichihei Award. Amazing. Ambassador Tamita also graduated from the University of Tokyo, Faculty of Law, and most importantly, he's married to Noriko and has two daughters and a son. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Tomita. Thank you. Ambassador, we're so glad to have you here today. And uh, I, I thought maybe we could start the dialogue because people want to know is, is of course the US-Japan summit. And uh, it was very successful. And you know, this on January 13th, so not long ago, and one of the comments that President Biden said was that this was a remarkable moment in our alliance. He said, quote, I don't think there's ever been a time when we've been closer to Japan in the United States. And uh, at, this was after the revised national security strategy and other defense documents that came out and uh, a spotlight on the role of Japan. So I wondered if if you might be able to share with us some of your observations, as well as what might be also the implications locally here in Hawaii and in also in the U.S.-Japan alliance, given um, the recent announcements on defense and security. Well, before uh, I answer your question, thank you very much for, for uh, having me. Um, and also a very gracious introduction, although you made me feel very old. 40 years in, in this business, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a very rewarding job, you know, I've been in this post uh, two years now, 
it's a long overdue coming here. I mean, it's uh, given the uh, very important relationship that exists between Japan and the Hawaii, but uh, here I am. And I'm glad to be here uh, to be able to talk to you on a very important subject. And uh, you mentioned the radio's meeting. Indeed, uh, you know, Japan hands in Washington been calling this man's Japan Yuri because there are so many <laughs> important, <laughs> important events taking place, not just uh, Prime Minister Kishida's visit. But uh, prior to that, we had the two plus two meeting. It's a meeting of uh, ministers in charge of foreign affairs and defense. And uh, I think I, I received the five cabinet ministers altogether and two different uh, um, diet delegation. So I, I felt like I'd done the year's work already. But anyway, <laughs> coming back to the leaders meeting, as he said, that was a great success. And uh, there are a number of reasons uh, which contributed to the success. Uh, first and foremost, I, th I think there was an incredible personal chemistry that exists between Prime Minister Kishida and uh, President Biden. Um, and also, as you mentioned, uh, there's an incredible level of alignment of, of, of our interests and policy. And actually, uh, in addition to the comment made by President Biden, I mentioned there's a during the uh, two press two meeting, Tony Blinken said he is he, he's never seen um, such close alignment of policies that exist between any two countries. So that shows you how close we are uh, in a in a outlook uh, policy and so on. So forth. Um, but the most important thing is the two leaders brought to the meeting, unprecedented level of commitment to our lives. And on Prime Minister Kishida's part, uh, the, the commitment uh, was best uh, expressed uh, in the National uh, Defense Policy Review you mentioned. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, last December, uh, Kishida government adopted the uh, uh, update of key policy instruments over national defense policies and which include uh, um, substantial upgrade of our you know, commitment to defense efforts, including uh, bringing the level of uh, defense uh, spending to the, to the order of 2% two, two of G GDP. And also our new commitment includes uh, um, developing new c capabilities, uh, including uh, counter-strike capability, which uh, we have, uh, is true from doing uh, in the past. Um, so this is a definite uh, new commitment to strengthening uh, our alliance. And, uh, you know, writing all these uh, strategies is one thing, but uh, put them into practice is a completely another matter. So I think we, we need to make our best efforts to, to, to implement what we have announced uh, to do, and uh, this requires uh, even closer co coordination between the United States. Uh, for instance, the counter-strike capability is not just a question of procuring a new missiles, but you, you have to acquire the uh, capacity to, to operate uh, the, the new system effectively. And uh, we wouldn't be able to do that without uh, uh, help from the uh, US friends. Let me just add two things um, uh, relating to this uh, uh, new defense uh, strategy. The first is, I was having a discussion with Amelia Solis, Brookings, uh, 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 a week ago, and she asked whether this is a revolutionary or evolutionary. And my answer was, this is definitely evolutionary in the sense that it is supported by definite change of public mindset about the security policy. In other words, we have a very strong public support for the latest efforts. And this has been driven by increasing the serious you know, security environment. But uh, we have now full public support for, for the government efforts to give up our defense efforts. And uh, also it's striking that we have 
no serious uh, complaining complaints expressed by our neighboring countries. Of course, certain countries <laughs> express their displeasure, but if you look at uh, you know uh, Southeast Asia, Korea, we we didn't have um, serious you know displeasure expressed by those countries. So I think uh, we have a support for Japan doing more uh, constructive efforts in the maintenance of peace and stability in the region. The last thing I would say is uh, this broader picture is um, not just, a, we have to make efforts, not just in the, in the context of military capabilities. Um, security these days is a holistic effort. So we need to work on uh, economic security, for instance, we are doing a lot of work on, on supply chains, protecting uh, critical infrastructures, trying to maintain uh, uh, age and technological leadership. And also we are making a lot of diplomatic efforts to engage the broader community, particularly in the Pacific, so Quad, uh, Pacific Islands and so on so forth. So, so that's something I would add uh, in explaining uh, you know, the latest defense efforts. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador, for that really comprehensive view. And Japanuary, I will remember. That's pretty <laughs> phenomenal. But you bring up such excellent points about the um, citizenry of Japan yeah. and how they view the current situation. But there's no question that Japan, this evolutionary alliance, um, a lot of your leadership as well. So thank you for your years of service and in advancing this partnership. You brought up but another piece is regional leadership, but global leadership. Mm -hmm. And so I want to ask another question on, on um, you know, being that Japan will host the G7 annual summit. And you talked about, yeah. you know, economic security really is national security and global mm -hmm. security. Um, it will be held in May in Hiroshima and leaders of the world's largest and advanced democracies will discuss, of course, the pressing global concerns. Mm -hmm. So I wondered you know, what is expected from your view um, from Japan as the chair of the G7? Well, that's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, first of all, we, we have um, G, G, G7 has increased its relevance because of the, uh, the recent evolution in national relations. You mentioned in your introduction, I was uh, uh, Prime Minister Abed Sherpa for G20, but unfortunately, because of what happened in Ukraine, um, G20 has become, you know, kind of dysfunctional. You know, it's it's even more difficult for us to uh, get something done uh, in that forum. So, I think G G7 uh, has become even more important. Uh, and uh, this particular summit meeting coming up in May will particularly uh, consequential because of the. Uh, the older, you know, recent evolution in national relations, not just Ukraine, but uh, rising tension in, in Asia. And also the global society trying to uh, um, uh, correct the dislocation uh, coming from the uh, pandemic. So there are many issues out front. Um, but I think uh, as we, as we, try to prepare for the meeting, I think two things um, are utmost in our, in, our, in our mind. The first is a rule of law. I think this will be a very important uh, theme for the summit, uh, not just because of the, what's happening in Ukraine. Ukraine is of course a very important um, uh, development, uh, but uh, you know, uh, there are, um, Attempt to, to change unilaterally status quo are taking place in other parts of the world as well. So after watching how fragile you know, the national order is, I think it is very important for, for G7 country to reconfirm the importance of rule of law. I think that would be the uh, uh, very important part of the uh, uh, discussions uh, in Hiroshima. The other equally important subject would be uh, um, how to engage the rest of the world. Uh, I, I really don't like the term global south 
but uh, you know, uh, but th that is the uh, term uh, that has been used uh, quite frequently. But uh, you know, what, whatever term uh, we use, I think it's important for G7 country to try to reach out uh, to, to the broader international community. But in doing so, not just reaching out is, is, is enough. I think, uh, um, I think G7 has to uh, play a leadership role uh, in areas uh, which uh, are a source of concern for, for those kind of climate change and health, public health, or debt, um, infrastructure development, and so on. So, uh, not just reaching out. But also try to bring a tangible benefits to to these these uh, broader international community. I think it will be a um, really important subject. Uh, uh, G7 leaders will be discussing. The final point is Japan is the only uh, Asian uh, uh, representative in the G7 process. So I think Prime Minister is very conscious of the fact that the, the meeting is going to be held in in, in this part the world, I mean, in the Pacific region. So uh, we are looking for all the leaders deepening their conversation and understanding of the challenges and also opportunities um, that exist in this, in the broad, uh, broader in the Pacific region, which I think will have a very important implication for the state of Hawaii. You know, after all, Hawaii is in the bangle in the middle of this, this vast region. So. Uh, so the meeting will be a uh, consequential uh, for for you know not just uh, um, national society or not just the G7 members but a broader international community and uh, the state of Hawaii, Hawaii as well. Thank you, Ambassador, for those comments. You're absolutely right. I mean, so many challenges that will be addressed. You said outside of just traditional security economy, but health challenges, yeah. the climate and its impact, and no other place more than we realize being at the crossroads of the Pacific here in Hawaii um, and this vast Oceania and Pacific Ocean, which brings me to another question on the role that Japan is playing, not only leadership in G7, um, but also in, as part of the partners of the Blue Pacific in addressing and coordination. You talked about um, not just singular leadership, but coordination with a variety of partners. And I, I wondered what is the Japan's commitment a little more specifically, and, and you did mention Hawaii and our role, but I just wondered if you could share a little bit more. Yeah, I think, you know, partnership in Blue Pacific is, is uh, the part of the, uh, the broader efforts to engage uh, in national community uh, started. I think the, I, I, I give a lot of credit um, to uh, the Biden administration in, in, in uh, making efforts in this area, starting with the Quad, for instance, and then uh, IPEF engaging South Pacific, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and then this this uh, uh, initiative on the uh, Pacific Island issues. And uh, you know, Blue Pacific across uh, the the forum itself, I think we are starting uh, several modest uh, projects. Uh, you know, humanitarian uh, disaster relief climate change and so on and so forth. And no doubt, I think the, uh, the, we are going to uh, um, expand our cooperation through this process. But uh, at the same time, this, this particular forum is, I, I see more sort of as a, as a process, you know, all the countries participating uh, in this process, you know, in, in Japan, the US, Australia, New Zealand, or some other European partners, they have, they, all have unique you know, ties, unique historical connection with the, uh, the, uh, the islands because the island countries are so diverse. And uh, by doing so, I think uh, each member can bring its own expertise, unique expertise and experience. And so that we can have a synergy in supporting um, the island's efforts to resolve all these uh, um, exist various challenges, I mean, including climate change and other. And uh, I think Japan um, has been one of the biggest donors uh, in this region. And we have a lot of experience in engaging the highest level of government. We have a process called PALM, you know, leaders meeting process. So I think uh, um, we could uh, uh, 
uh, make a useful contribution uh, as we try to develop synergy uh, among the uh, uh, contributions made by all these members. Thank you for that. And thank you for your role in leadership in the Pacific. And so getting a little more specific, you said they're all unique, just like Hawaii is very unique sitting at the crossroads of the Pacific. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, bring our next question a little bit more to Hawaii. You know, what can Hawaii and the broader U.S. expect from Japan in terms of, you know, education here in Hawaii? East West Center, as you know, really yeah. was founded that first 1960 when Eisenhower signed the authorization of the East West Center. We had many uh, students from Japan who came here to the East West Center and became those leaders that we saw early on in Japan. Um, so just wondered in terms of what does it look like in terms of supporting education uh, students from Japan? Um, you know, here, 27.3% of Hawaii's international students are Japanese students and $31.1 million are invested in Hawaii as a result of Japanese students before pre-COVID. So I uh, just wondered if you could share what, what does the prospects look like for Hawaii in terms of educational exchange? Well, I start with a you know, broader picture, you know, um, it's, it's rather unfortunate that in recent years, we are starting to see a decline of Japanese students uh, studying in the United States. And uh, this, this trend has existed for some years now, and we are, we've been trying to analyze, you know, the, the reason why, you know, uh, this is the case. And we can point to a number of factors. Um, uh, some people say that the younger generations are not so, you know, uh, ambitious, you know, they are very comfortable staying in Japan and so on and so forth. That, that, to my mind, the biggest challenge is the uh, extremely high level of tuitions, mm -hmm. financial reason, because it's so expensive sending your kids up to the United States these days. When I, you know, as you mentioned in, in my uh, introduction, I, I spent one year in North Carolina. These days, I, my, my parents can afford to, to send me there. Yeah. Although it just for one, one year, but these days uh, it's so expensive. So I think the government needs to step in mm -hmm. to to uh, to support. But that's the reason why um, uh, Japanese government is now trying to to uh, develop new action plan uh, to increase uh, the student exchange both ways. You know, not just uh, sending Japanese students abroad, but also accepting more uh, overseas students in Japan. And uh, the result of this process will come out sometime in the spring. So you're going to see a more, lot more robust efforts. But a government effort is not, you know, uh, just government support is not enough. You know? It has to be supported by the efforts taken by all those stakeholders. And uh, in that context, I uh, like to uh, um, pay my tribute to, to what um, uh, this university is doing and uh, this center has been doing in terms of uh, promoting uh, 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 student exchanges, uh, which program, and also you have uh, been doing a very useful uh, academic exchanges, um, for instance, with Okinawa, for instance. So uh, we very much look forward to working uh, with uh, relevant stakeholders, including the uh, uh, East West Center uh, to 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 um, to reverse this this unfortunate uh, development in recent years. Thank you so much for that. That's very reassuring. We're very <laughs> excited, and you definitely have a partner here at East West Center, University of Hawaii, and all of our Hawaii institutions, Hawaii Pacific University, Shamanad. So we have a, a lot of our community colleges as well have a lot of the um, students from Japan. You know, um, moving to another question on Hawaii, Ambassador is. You know, um, in terms of where can we expect expansion of maybe partnership cooperation in terms of government trade tourism here in Hawaii? And as you know, um, the largest export market for Hawaii is Japan. And pre-COVID, there was $286 million in Japanese visitors spending, um, jobs created, thousands of jobs created, uh, a lot of investments in Hawaii. Uh, 
2019 pre-COVID, 1,576,000 visitors to Hawaii. And wondered if you could, you know, share, there's obviously a special relationship when uh, just talking to you earlier, 1885, 900 Japanese came to Hawaii. So we have a very large uh, Japanese, American Japanese population here. Um, we have senior leaders like Senator Hirono, Representative Tokuda, Senator Inoy, Se Sp Senator Spark Matsunaga. So we've had many key critical leaders come that have been a bridge to Japan. So I wondered if you could just share just some of your thoughts on future. Right. Okay. Well, you know, usually I'm in Washington, you know, working with the administration, but uh, I'm fully aware that uh, what is driving a bilateral relation is not, you know, the small discussion taking place in Washington. It's uh, exchanges taking place in all over the United States, you know. Uh, that's the reason why I try to go out of Washington as much as possible to, to see firsthand, you know, what's happening. Uh, so I, I visit uh, the state and each state has distinct uh, feature in terms of exchanges. For instance, I visit, when I visit the Midwest states like Indiana, Tennessee, there are huge Japanese investment in manufacturing, you know, automaking and so on and so forth. California, different, you know, uh, traditional, historical, uh, and, and Hawaii is very unique. I mean, as you mentioned, uh, the historical connection, geographical proximity, and, uh, you know, uh, so I think this is something we can work on. Uh, the solid foundation, this is a great asset. You know, we, we can, we can uh, uh, build on uh, as we look, look toward the future of our collaboration. And, and uh, just had a lunch with the Governor Green, and we had a very useful conversation. And, uh, uh, you know, first and foremost, I think our priority is to, to rebuild uh, the tourist uh, relations. As you mentioned, there's a very sharp decline uh, of Japanese tourists coming here because of COVID. And the problem has been compounded by the, uh, the exchange rate ratio. You know? It's a very expensive for Japanese car uh, tourists to come to, to the United States. So, and um, um, so I, I think uh, uh, rebuilding uh, traditional uh, tourist relation, I think, should come as a first priority. But there are other areas I think we, we can work on. I think Governor Green mentioned uh, his uh, very strong focus on clean energy, for instance. Uh, and he's advocating uh, promoting uh, collaboration, for instance, in the area of hydrogen, for instance. And uh, I think this, I think we can find a common interest in, in uh, promoting uh, cooperation in these new areas. So, um, so I think there are many things we can look forward to, but always, always, I think we can uh, come back to the human connection that we have built over the years. I think this is a, the very foundation I think we can, we can rely on as we try to upgrade our, our partnership in the future. Thank you, Ambassador. I appreciate that um, outside of our traditional thinking of just tourism, but uh, partnering in clean energy, using technology to enhance our, our, um, our lives and creating sustainable options for investment for Hawaii, the Pacific and working together to reach out. So thank you so much for, for this time. I, I wanna, if you're okay, if we transition to offering to the audience, because it's not every day we have the Japanese ambassador to the United States here in Hawaii. <laughs> so we're so fortunate to have you here. Yeah. We'd like to um, uh, go ahead and ask um, if you don't mind for our audience here, we have a podium that, that's, um, that we're going to move up here so that you can be on screen as well. And if you're okay with it, if you feel comfortable, uh, if you could come and say your name and who you are, and uh, that way our audience online can see you as well. Um, and maybe our former previous president of the East-West Center, Dr. Richard Wolstek, also professor at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Wolstek, 
turned out. But thank you very much for your candid. I think that is it on. Is that light on? Yeah, there you go. Try again. Okay. Your Excellency, thank you again for your candid comments and insightful as well. You mentioned earlier on economics and supply chain dynamics, mm -hmm. and both uh, Japan and the United States are reevaluating their uh, supply chain connections, in particular to China, and looking at uh, diversifying location. Do you see opportunities for cooperation between the United States and Japan on, on diversifying uh, supply chains together, not only to the United States, for example, but also maybe working together in Southeast Asia and elsewhere? Yes, I think uh, there's, uh, I think, great potential uh, in working together on the, uh, the question of supply chains. I think supply chains can be discussed in a number of contexts, you know, for instance, in the context of pandemic, you know, uh, we come to realize how fragile our industrial base for some, some product that can be critical in certain situation. So um, uh, developing the resilience in these areas, one thing. And the other context is, as I mentioned, uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, in the context of strategic competition with, with China. And uh, uh, even in that context, I think there's a growing uh, awareness that we need to uh, be uh, uh, more resilient and we, are, we have to be more competitive. And in the context of being resilient, I think uh, we have been doing a lot of discussion on supply chain issues, uh, semiconductors, not just semiconductors, but also uh, uh, critical mineral, for instance. And there are a number of areas we are looking at to ensure that uh, um, uh, we have, uh, we, we, we can protect us sensitive supply chains. But the supply chain question <laughs> Is a, is a big challenge because uh, you know it's it's not something the government can alone uh, can 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 uh, implement because uh, of course uh, in the area of export control, for instance, I think uh, government can impose certain restrictions, but even that area, I think we need to work with our industry. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, trying to ensure that we have a good industrial base for chips production. And this is not, this is not uh, going to uh, happen overnight. You, know? you need to have an ecosystem to, to or enabling environment uh, to do that. So it's a long-term challenge. We need to work with the industry. And uh, ultimately, I think whatever we do, I think it has to make a business sense. Otherwise, it's not going to be uh, sustainable. So this is an area where we need to do a lot of collaboration among the older stakeholders, but this is a very important subject and we'll be very much focused on it. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Volstek, for that. Those of you who are online, I forgot to mention, you can put your question in the chat or, I mean, in the Q&A portion, and then we'll be able to see uh, any of your questions, but in the meantime, we'll wait. Uh, if you have any issues, you can chat to our tech team in the back as well. So we'll take more questions here. So feel free if you're if you're worried about having to come to the podium. I'm happy to bring you this microphone to you. See, no one wants to come up to the podium. You'll come on up. Thank you, <laughs> our Consul General from Australia. Um, Ambassador, yes, Andrea Gleason, Consul General for Australia. Um, I was interested in learning a bit more about Japan's work with the US on climate change with the Biden administration. That's obviously uh, an issue of great um, urgency and particularly here in Hawaii, and it's a common theme for Pacific Island countries. So yeah, if you could just talk a little more about that. Yeah, that's right. Well, um, first of all, we, 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 we uh, share a common interest in, in uh, fighting uh, this this uh, one of the most serious challenge uh, challenges facing the uh, humankind. So um, we have been working uh, very closely on a number of fronts. You know, uh, uh, in national cooperation, uh, setting a target, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but uh, the areas that we've been focused on one area is the technology. And uh, uh, 
I think when uh, Prime Minister Suga visited uh, um, Washington last year, we, we started a sort of you know, partnership program uh, specifically designed to promote uh, uh, climate technology. Uh, so we, we've been trying to um, do a number of areas like hydrogen, uh, you know, uh, uh, other areas as well. And, but at the same time, when, you know, Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, um, there's an increased uh, concern about energy security. So I think uh, um, that has led to a certain shift in our mindset. So nowadays, I think we, we feel it necessary to, let's just focusing on the climate change, but also how to ensure energy security as we make these efforts. So uh, in our discussions uh, with the United States, we're not just talking about uh, uh, climate technology, but also energy cooperation as well. So um, we are, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, discussing the possibility of the US expanding its production of natural gas, for instance, which is a very important uh, uh, source of energy for transition uh, period. And also, uh, we are also looking at uh, advanced nuclear technology as well because uh, it's a very important part of the solution for a country like Japan, you know, uh, uh, with a very uh, uh, little natural endowment for, for the resources and also very sharp decline of, you know, uh, public confidence in nuclear energy after Fukushima incident. So um, coming up with a new uh, and safer nuclear technology is a very important part of our efforts to address uh, the challenge of climate change. So uh, I think we have a very diverse interest in, 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 in tackling um, all the ramifications of climate change. And we have a very strong focus on this area in our bilateral cooperation. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Council General. How about other questions in the audience? We, I see somebody, please. Thank you, I'm Carlos Juarez here at the East West Center. Thank you for your remarks. I, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more from your experience of, on what I would, what we call subnational diplomacy. Increasingly, we see states and cities carrying on a lot more, you know, what would traditionally be the diplomatic efforts. Uh, you spoke about uh, visiting maybe places like Tennessee, Indiana. All these places are connected to Japan, of course. But what I guess, uh, you know, any reflections, but also I see it, there's opportunities, but I see challenges, whether it's from your own staffing to how to deal with this, or you're dealing with a lot of different, just more players. Uh, so any reflections on this? Uh, the State Department, you may know, has recently appointed a new special envoy for subnational mm -hmm. diplomacy, which is an effort to look at this. So any reflections on that? Well, as I said, I mean, it's, um, the United States is a diverse country. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, just, Working in Washington, and Washington is a very unique place, you know. So, I, as I said, I try to go out, um, try to visit states. Um, and as I said, I mean, it, I mean, things are happening on the ground, you know, uh, business. Uh, you know, for instance, Japan has been the largest foreign, foreign investor in this country and creating a lot of jobs. And this is very important. And uh, um, particularly, you know, I've been dealing with the Japanese relations for many years, but in 1970, well, no, I, I joined the Foreign Service in 81, so 80s and early 90s. We had a very serious trade, trade dispute. You know, that was, you know, one of the biggest focuses over various discussions. But what happened was, after this, this trade friction, Japanese uh, company decided to invest here and start producing uh, you know, automobiles here in the US, creating jobs, contributing to the local economy. And that has a huge impact on the uh, um, uh, economic you know, uh, relations. Uh, no longer we are not 
so concerned about you know the, how many uh, cars are we are exporting and anything like that. So that shows you how important it is to ensure that we have uh, strong connections at, on the ground. You know, so not just business, but also uh, people to be ex people exchange human connections, and we talked about student exchange. I think those are very, very important aspect. And um, as, you, as you said, I mean, it's a challenge because what's happening on the ground is, is different from one place to another. So we, we have to be uh, more sort of, we have to uh, cater to very diverse needs existing in this country. So that uh, takes a lot of, uh, um, efforts, time and energy. But we do have 14 uh, consular general um, in, in this country. And here in the in the state of Hawaii, I, you know, we have a, one of the most competent uh, foreign service officer <laughs> in uh, uh, consular general Aoki. Um, so, you know, uh, being in Washington, I have uh, uh, every confidence in, in, you know, all uh, consular business uh, offices doing their, their best job in promoting uh, uh, connections um, at all level and in all, all sectors. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, Carlos, for that question. You know, I often think of it as very organic. There's not so much, like you said, going on, but there's so much leadership also at that subnational level and people to people relationships that are happening every day. And even on our own board of governors is the uh, Takni Inami, who's on our East West Center board. So Santori CEO, part of you know connecting on a people to people, helping us look at biodiversity and to think about that uh, in different ways and impacting. So very very exciting. So I know there's more questions out there. Not every day that you're going to have the <laughs> ambassador. Please, Karen. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Karen Knudsen. I'm adjunct fellow senior at the East West Center, but I also chair the Higher Education Committee for the Japan American Society here in Hawaii. And I was very interested in what you said about the report coming out about exchange students and in the mm -hmm. future. Will key points of that be in English by any chance? We, we, we work here trying to have local students look at Japan to go to school because it's more affordable and to make that connection. And whether it's Mambusho or Mofa that is doing that report? I, I think uh, uh, I, I, I'm not abreast with the uh, how the mechanics of sports is, but uh, I think it was based on prime minister instruction uh, to review the uh, you know, set, set of ideas surrounding the student exchange. So I think this uh, you know process will be fairly comprehensive involving uh, all the uh, key agencies. So. So I uh, like to make sure that, that once the report comes out and uh, you know, it will be uh, uh, shared by, by uh, stakeholders here in the US. Just, I'm sorry, follow up. Also, is it more US focused or will it be no, all over worldwide? Broader, broader. Good, I think it will be useful for so many people in other countries. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that important question about education. Um, anyone else in our audience? Our online group is shy, or either they have technical issues. So hopefully it's not the technical issues, they're shy. Hello, Ambassador. My name is Christian Wright. I'm the senior diplomatic fellow here at the East West Center from the US State Department, I'm a foreign service officer of 20 years. What would, uh, when, as we look forward, as we prepare our relationship with Japan in the future, what are, in your opinion, as sort of uh, looking into the future, what are the demographic changes, the generational changes, the technolo technological changes that you think will affect, uh, you know, Japanese diplomacy moving forward or, or life in Japan or the U.S.-Japanese relationship? Mm. Well, uh, in terms of a strategic challenge, yeah, I think uh, there's no doubt that uh, you know, how to respond to the uh, challenge posed by China will be the biggest uh, 
um, uh, agenda. I think uh, Japan and the United States uh, will share in, in the years to come. And um, um, but at the same time, I mean, we, we know that, that this is going to be a very complex undertaking. You know, uh, of course, uh, uh, we are concerned about the quite substantial and rapid buildup of uh, Chinese military capabilities. And you know, we, we cannot accept certain aspects of their behavior. But at the same time, we are fully aware that um, China uh, is, a, after all, the second largest economy in the world, deeply integrated into the global economy. And they have a capacity as well as responsibility to contribute to resolution of some of the, the main challenges facing our, our human humankind, including climate change. So we need to work uh, with a with a with a Chinese friends in tackling these issues. And also uh, we need to ensure stability in our relations. You know, after all, the relationship between number one economy in the world number two economy world matters for the global society. And so does the relationship between number two economy in the world and number three economy in the world. So I think Japan and the United States share the responsibility to, to ensure certain stability um, in our relation with China. So, so I, I mentioned the, you know, three or four objectives and balancing all these uh, uh, objectives uh, in, a, in a daily efforts, uh, it's going to be a real challenge. Um, but uh, that's the reason why we, we need to uh, um, uh, ensure that we have a very close alignment of our, 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 our policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. But apart from that, I think uh, Japan and the United States, uh, uh, I think, uh, we are in a position to lead the global global efforts to, to address uh, some of the uh, biggest challenges, uh, like, as I mentioned, repeatedly climate change. Um, but uh, other issues as well. Uh, so the, uh, our alliance has, these days have much broader outlook than just you know, protecting ourselves. Uh, it's for the, uh, um, welfare of the global society as well. Uh, so uh, we always engage ourselves uh, in, a, in a very broad discussions. And um, I, I look forward to being part of this effort uh, as, as long as I serve as ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador. Any other questions? Dr. Volstek has another question. Never pass the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, this is a changing subject a little bit. You mentioned uh, policy and institutional structure is one thing, but information, implementation is another. I wonder if you could speak to the quad as it exists now, and if you could wave a magic wand and solve the most important functional implementation problem, what would that be? You mean quad? The quad. I see, okay. The relationship and the <laughs> process forward. Well, I think uh, the biggest challenge is that we, 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 we don't have a habit of collaboration within that, you know, the framework. Of course, uh, there has been accumulation of collaboration taking place between bilaterally, you know, between Japan and the United States, Japan and India and so on. Collect uh, collectively, there has no, uh, uh, tradition of working together in that particular format. So uh, I think it's a challenge. Uh, so it makes sense that uh, in the context of court cooperation, we, we are trying to start with a practical cooperation, like a vaccination or infrastructure, things that involve the broad participation for each government. So that would create human connections and as I said, the habit of collaboration. So um, code has been in existence for many years. Uh, you know, it started with the uh, 
East Java uh, earthquake. So it's been there, but uh, it's been promoted to the leader, leader's level just quite recently. So we uh, try to reinvigorate uh, the process of cooperation, but still I think we need uh, uh, some maturing over, over collaboration around within this, this specific format. But we look forward to expanding this cooperation. It's a very important strategic framework. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. I do have an online question from Christy Govela. Um, Ambassador Tamita, also thank you for your remarks. Could you give us some insights into how, and you mentioned this earlier, trade fits into Japan's current relationship with the United States. Clearly the domestic politics of trade in the US make trade liberalization challenging. But how is Japan thinking about engaging with the US specifically on trade as it navigates its involvement with bilateral agreements, IPEF, CPTPP, RCEP, and other initiatives? I think um, one of the uh, disappointment I, 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 uh, I felt when I came to uh, um, this country as ambassador two years ago is there's so much um, distrust uh, about trade. You know, trade has become a dirty word, um, and there's a reason. I, I, I can see the reason why trade has become such a toxic uh, um, uh, 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 concept uh, for mind of many many Americans. So. I can I can relate to that, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I talked about our security or our strategic competition. These concepts are holistic, you know, not just the meeting, but the economic uh, as well. And trade is a very important part of, of this this, uh, this this framework. So i think uh, it's important for the united states to be in the position of, in the position of leadership in, in promotion of trade and investment in the fast growing area in the world so of course our uh, hope is the united states decides to come back to the cptpp but i i'm I, i'm realistic enough uh, to to uh, accept that this is not going to happen anytime soon. But IPF, uh, of course, is very important um, uh, because of substance in itself is a very important subject, like uh, digital trade. But also, um, it's important in terms of strategic symbolism that the United States continues to, 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 to engage uh, in vision through the uh, trade and investment. And also in terms of substance, um, we are going to discuss the issues like a, um, labor and the environment. These are very important subjects. Um, I, I was talking about you know, the trade becoming a toxic uh, in the US politics. And uh, the attention on the issues like labor and the environment are, are part of this region. So deepening conversation among the uh, IPF members on issues like labor and investment uh, environment. I think it's a very important uh, efforts to, to build a foundation on which the next level of US involvement uh, in the region can be uh, contemplated. So I, I think, uh, of course, we, we very much hope that um, US coming back, US will come back to CPT. But there are other things we, we need to do um, to before this this uh, for the time being unlikely event will, will come to uh, come to uh, materialize. Well, thank you, thank you, Ambassador. We're coming up to our time right now, and uh, I I want to just maybe ask you one last question myself mm -hmm. on uh, being here in Hawaii and having traveled across the United States. Um, maybe you could just on a light-hearted note. What about the United States, Hawaii, that you uh, that that you find special in this connection with Japan? Just personally, personally, 
like many other Japanese, uh, the first time I, I came here, I was on honeymoon. <laughs> uh, except that the honeymoon wasn't really honeymoon because uh, when I got married, I was working in the minister's office. So I just couldn't get away. And uh, so when I, when I came to Hawaii for rather belated honeymoon, uh, my, my first kid was born. So uh, uh, three of us coming to stay. But I decided to do a you know, honeymoon anyway because I realized that without honeymoon, I, I, my wife would be uh, nagging me for the rest of my life. <laughs> so uh, that's the reason why I came here. That I, you know, as soon as I came here, I appreciate um, what a what a wonderful place um, this place is. Then I start working um, more seriously about uh, security relations and so on and so forth. So come to uh, uh, realize how strategically important um, this place is. I mean, Hawaii is in strategic. The important uh, my in terms of my relations with my, my wife, but uh, <laughs> um, but uh, you know uh, this is very important uh, uh, part of uh, you know our partnership with this country. And as I said, I, you know after two years of my arrival, it's, it's uh, long overdue. But I'm glad that uh, I here finally, and I'm enjoying myself tremendously including this wonderful event. Thank you so much, Ambassador. We're so grateful that you could spend time, answer a variety, a whole range of questions. Uh, very, very insightful. And we're so pleased that our East West Center office in Washington, DC, that you will be there for the Japan Matters for America rollout on February 7th, where you know Senator Hirono will be speaking, as well as a message from our, our US Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel to talk about the importance of why we matter for each other in terms of trade, uh, exchange, sister cities, job creation. I mean, a whole host of reasons why we matter for one another. And you've laid out a lot of that here. So we're very excited that you could do that. And um, thank you for all of you who joined us online and those of you who are here in person. Uh, we again, will have this on the YouTube for you to share with others because this was a really special day to have you here. Uh, the relationship is deep and there's so many more possibilities now that you've been here. So thank you so much. So please join me in a round of applause to thank the ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you.